talking today with Tom Peacock of Villas, New Jersey. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Tom, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on May 24th, 49. Okay. Uh, my parents moved across the river to my mother's hometown, Gloucester City, mm -hmm. a little river town uh, directly underneath the Woolwood Bridge, actually. As you drive across the Woolwood Bridge, you look down to your right, and you can look right into Mom's backyard. All right. So, uh, uh, okay, so is that where you grew up? That's where I grew up. Went to school there, 12 years, Catholic school. Okay. Uh, and when did you finish high school? 1967. Okay. Well, with Gloucester Catholic. Okay. And what was your family doing for a living when you were a kid? My father worked at the paper mill down, down along the river. Mm -hmm. He was a general laborer, and he actually ended up getting promoted eventually to shipping clerk. Pretty okay. decent job. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. All right. And I had one brother, Henry, Henry Jr. At least I didn't get stuck with that. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So when did you finish high school? 67. Okay. And what did you do after you got out? I went to work for a uh, engineering company as a, as a surveyor apprentice. Okay. And I worked there for the summer of 67. Mm -hmm. And at the time, as everybody well knows, you were a young man, you had two choices. You went to college or you went to Vietnam. You weren't allowed to work. Mm -hmm. so, I tried going to college. I went. I enlisted, uh, enrolled, enrolled in Camden County College. At the time, every county in New Jersey was open to these little colleges mm -hmm. for people to go to to hide out, I guess, right. more or less. And uh, I put in three months, and I couldn't stand it because I never did like school. Mm -hmm. Never did. I did well in school, but I never. I wanted to be out in the real world, making right. money. I had a girlfriend. I had a car. You know, I had money in my wallet. Couldn't do that when I went to college, so I went to went back, and then I went uh, after I quit school in December of '67. I went to work for another engineering outfit uh, in Camden, New Jersey, <coughs> which is right up the street from where I lived. Right, and uh, worked there until I got drafted in February '69. Actually, I got my draft notice in January, about the middle of January. So you had about a year before Uncle Sam caught yeah, up with you. Yeah, a little over a year, year and a half. Okay. Uh, now, once you've been drafted, where do you go for basic training? Uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. And describe a little bit what that was like for you. I thought it was pretty easy, to tell you the truth. I was in fairly good shape. I didn't drink or smoke at the time, and I did a little bit of athletics. I played a lot of basketball as a kid, and running and jumping and all. So it didn't bother me at all. I thought it was kind of a, kind of a joke. Uh, after eight weeks of basic, then they sent us to... Okay. Eight weeks of advanced infantry taming, which is also at Fort Dix. So I was 35 miles from home the whole 16 weeks. All right. Now, eight weeks then, were most of the people you were training alongside people from New York, New Jersey, that area? Mostly uh, New Jersey and Connecticut, and we had some West Virginia. Uh, surprisingly, Philadelphia, they, most of those guys went down to Fort Jackson. South Carolina. South yeah. Carolina for their training. Okay. Now, uh, did you have guys there who uh, either made trouble or just couldn't adjust very well? I can't remember anybody. Uh, we were all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. you know? We ran in age groups. I mean, we had we actually had a couple of guys who were mid twenties, mm -hmm. and they were the ones that really had trouble with the, the physical part. Okay. And, and what about just the, the the drill and discipline thing? Didn't bother me at all. Okay. I, it was basically what I expected. I okay. wasn't surprised. Now, were the uh, people who were training you, had, had they been to Vietnam? Yes. Yes. My drill sergeant, as a matter of fact, I looked him up a couple of years ago, Ralph Evilsizer, staff sergeant, mm -hmm. and he was killed in Vietnam in July, I think, June or July of 69. Okay. But had he been to Vietnam oh, yes. before he was to Vietnam? Okay. okay, so he was on a second yes. tour then? He was on his second tour. All right. Did you also have some new sergeants who were helping the trainers? Like the yes. Type? Yeah. Right. You, had, uh, you had your main drill sergeant, and under him there were two or three, uh, usually eight, five buck sergeants. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a staff. He had a rocker under us. Right. Okay. All right. So you go through eight weeks of basic and then the AIT. And how was the AIT different it from It was basic? a little tougher. It was, uh, it was like basic training without the benefits. Uh, basic training, they made sure you got to bed at 
certain time, you got your six hours or eight hours of sleep. Uh, they fed you well. We had a, we had a great mess hall. Um, AIT was completely different. It was mess hall terrible, <laughs> and they they didn't care if you got two hours of sleep. You know, they, it was a little tougher, but it wasn't. It was still at the time I was in d decent shape. It didn't bother me. In AIT, did you have any more freedom in terms of what you did with your yeah, time? Yeah, less. You had less. I okay. thought less. Yes, to me it was. Okay. So why weren't you getting sleep? Uh, they would have training. You'd be doing guard duty, or you'd be out on uh, they actually went night maneuvers and stuff like that, which should basically was a no-no. Okay. All right. Now, was this infantry training that you were getting? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, and how much of it was geared toward Vietnam? Very little, I thought. Uh, I always tell a story about uh, we were training to go to Vietnam. We had a mock village built up in the Pine Barrens, South Jersey. <laughs> And we're laying in about eight inches of snow, <laughs> practicing and infiltrating this village. And I'm thinking to myself, something's wrong here. Yeah, but well, that they, they were, were trying. Right, right. They did. What, and there was was very few AIT infantry from uh, Fort Dix. They only had I don't know how many cycles of recruits went through, but it wasn't that many because they were they weren't getting the product that they were getting out of Fort Polk, Louisiana, mm -hmm. for instance because that was a lot more realistic, I'm sure. Right. Okay. Because I have talked to people who went through Fort Dix and so forth, but and their experiences were kind of like yours. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, now, did you get a chance to go off the base at all and go home? I went home a couple times. Like I said, I was 35 miles away. So I remember when my dad came up and got me, and I think one of my other guys in my platoon, he was from Connecticut, I believe, and he, we actually came over and stayed at our house. You know, mom just put an extra steak on or whatever she had, right. you know. Okay. All right. Uh, so now you finish the AIT, what happens to you next? Uh, two weeks leave and report to Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. And off to Vietnam. All right. Uh, and, and what was your, I guess you had pretty much assumed once you got drafted that you were going to go to Vietnam? Yes. Uh, and I also knew that because they only had you for two years, they weren't mm -hmm. going to send you to you know, radar mechanic school or, you know, rocketry school or, you know, infantry. Right. You know, very simple uh, piece of mechanism to operate. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, uh, how much did you know about Vietnam at that point? Just what was on the news. You know, it was, it was basically a televised war every night on the news. You know, War Cronkite would have something about it. Now, I mean, did you have any views yourself about whether or not we should have been there or anything like that? None. Okay. Uh, or any sense of whether we were winning or losing? Or no. This? Just Uncle Sam said, go, and we went. Right. Okay. Uh, so now you're going. How did they get you to Vietnam? We flew. We flew a commercial line, uh, Continental Airlines. We left SeaTac um, Airport, I guess it was, or mm -hmm. must have been. Yeah. yeah. And we flew, we landed in Honolulu. I think we had like a two hour layover, and then we flew to the Philippines, and then from there, Cameron Bay, okay. Vietnam. And what's your first impression of Vietnam when you get there? Hot, sticky, smelly. You know, they were burning poop. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you look down, you see the black smoke, and you think, oh my God, they must be getting artillery or something, get the incoming. And it wasn't. It was, Burning poop. Human waste and diesel fuel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you get there. What now what happens to you when you get off the plane? Uh, somehow or other we ended up I know they put us up in a barracks and they did feed us. I remember we went through something, like they gave us a tooth some kind of toothbrush with super fluoride, I guess, treatment. Mm -hmm. And then from there we they had uh, bulb boards with your and you went and looked for your name. And I found my name and uh, 101st Replacement Company. Of course, I don't put two and two together because I never jumped out of an airplane. Mm -hmm. You know, I have no intention of jumping out of an airplane unless it's crashing. And they said, 101st, so we had, we had a report. We got went to the airport in Cameron and flew to Benoit, which is where the 101st Replacement Company was. So I come off the plane, me and five or six, ten, I don't know how many of us there were. I see all these people walking around with 101st Airport patches and screaming eagles. I said, holy crap, how'd I end up here? Which is a funny story. 
my father's brother, his older brother, Thomas Peacock. He was an original member of the 101st. That's a... And he broke his leg in a, a practice jump in England, mm -hmm. like a week before D-Day. Uh, he was... And in a book, Band of Brothers, mm -hmm. there's also a Thomas Peacock, mm -hmm. but he was a lieutenant. Okay, so it's not the same one? Okay. No relation. Oh, good. Funny though, three guys the same name as 101st. Mm -hmm. but I guess big units, you know. There you are. Okay. Uh, so, but that, that's, that's down at Benoit, and that's outside of Saigon. Right. Now, did you think that's where you were going to stay, or did you know where the I didn't know. was? I okay. uh, didn't know. Just, you know, we knew we were going, we weren't staying there. Mm -hmm. It was almost like civilization compared to where we ended up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they put us on a C-130 or, or a Chinook helicopter, I can't remember which, and we flew up to um, Camp Evans. Mm -hmm. And that's where we were. I was assigned to Delta Company, second of five was six. Okay. All right. Uh, so when do you arrive there? I think I landed in Vietnam, like around the fifth or sixth of July. It was right after the fourth of July. Okay. So that's in '69. Then. Nineteen sixty-nine. So I probably ended up in uh, Delta Company around the tenth. Okay. Uh, now, did the 101st give you any kind of orientation to Vietnam? Yes, we did have a, they called it P training down in Benoit. Mm -hmm. I think that was two or three days. And it was basically to run all the beer out of you, because we were on leave going to Vietnam. And okay. Even though we were underage. All right. <laughs> it gave you acclimatized or whatever. Yeah, so it gave you more use of the climate, right? Okay. All right. So, uh, now where was your company when you joined it? They were in the field. Okay. Uh, I know they handed. I got. That's where I got all my gear, my mm -hmm. weapon, and uh, I had her go down to the helicopter pad. And Yui uh, came in, and first sergeant handed me this big bright orange bag with mail in it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? You know, I'm going to be landing out in this jungle with everything's green on, mm -hmm. camouflage, and he's giving me this big orange bag. But I remember we landed on a hilltop. I jumped out of this out of the UE. That's before I knew to call them slicks. Mm -hmm. And I took about three steps, and there was a dead North Vietnamese soldier laying right there. And that's why I knew I was in a different place altogether. Okay. And I handed the bag to I don't even know who it was. Somebody came up and took the bag away from me. And they sent me down. And they said, "See these guys down here? They said you're going to be with them." And I said, "Fine." And one of the guys is Gumi Kano. We just met him downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this guy, a little Mexican kid. He's all dirty and filthy and grubby and stuff. And I thought, man, he's a hardcore combat vet. Found out he was there like three weeks longer than I was. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you joined them. And, and what was going on at that point? They were patrolling. We were in the Ashaw Valley, mm -hmm. uh, walking mountaintops, from ridge lines, really, from mm -hmm. mountain to mountain. And that's basically what we did. Day in and day out. Now, were you having much contact with the enemy? Very few, very few. We were probably the, we were probably the luckiest one of the luckiest companies in Vietnam, Delta Company, because I don't think we lost we lost a couple guys. And one one time, uh, the Cobra gunship by mistake. And in fact, that's where Gumi was wounded. Mm -hmm. He ended up going home. Poor guy. But we actually lost a guy that died. And one time we were. For some reason, they decided to send hot meals out to us on a hilltop, and they had these, we called them mermite cans, mm -hmm. or I don't know what they were really called, but they had hot chow in them, and usually did, we didn't want it. We'd rather eat sea rations, because, but after we ate, we started getting mortars. And one would land in front of us, one in the back, they were bracketing us, mm -hmm. and we said, let's get out of here, but apparently somebody, one of the higher-ups, probably at a battalion level, Said, oh no, you can't leave till the more mermaid cans get taken out. Oh. And then we really started getting out. They, they were really fired mortars heavy then. We, we, we got out of there, but unfortunately, one of the mortars landed in the hole mm -hmm. and killed three or four people because somebody wanted to save 500 mm -hmm. hours worth yeah. of equipment. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so at this point, then, so this is sort of um, kind of late summer, or what, what we would call late summer, fall of 69, yes. this is going on. Yeah. So how long did you stay in that area, do you think? 
we we were there all the time. We were we we would stay out for at least thirty days. Right. We would come out. We'd we'd wear the same clothes, same boots, same socks. Did you ever get a resupply where you could switch out the socks or underwear or things like that? Never wore underwear. That okay. was one of the first lessons we learned. Uh, one of the old guys came up to me and asked me, you wearing skivvies? I said, yeah. He said, take them off. He said, you don't want to be wearing them. You're getting jungle rot and you're going to, which you end up getting anyway, mm -hmm. but not as bad, I guess. Okay. You never wore, you never wore underwear. Uh, socks, I can't, maybe once or twice, maybe the whole year, got fresh socks. Most of the time it was, they used to bring in, it was either payday or the day before. You got paid once in a month in the Army. And of course you didn't keep any of your money. I, I was keeping, I think $25 a month, or maybe 50 I can't remember. But every once in a while when I got a chance in the rear, I would buy money orders and send that mm -hmm. home too. There was nowhere to spend it. Mm -hmm. but we were nowhere around any villages or, I mean, we were triple canopy jungle mountains mm -hmm. for the most part. And, uh, All right. Now at this point, uh, who was your company commander? I couldn't tell you. Okay. Because it wasn't Rollison yet? Rollison came in right when I got transferred. Okay. All right. Uh, and basically the guys you're serving with, they seemed to know what they were doing? Yeah, I think so. I think you're pretty professional in what we did. Okay. And were you getting into any real firefights or? No. And I was lucky, I didn't hurt it at the M60 machine gun. My new guy who originally had it went home, and mm -hmm. I ended up carrying that thing for about eight months, and I weighed about 120 pounds at the time, so. <laughs> I guess they said, this guy's real skinny, we'll let him carry a machine gun. Okay. Uh, but a machine gun would make you something of a target, though, if there it were would. a fight. It would, and also very heavy, and especially they'd put some little guy running Work walking point, he'd be going through these briars and bushes and stuff, and I'd be cursing them. <laughs> now, at this point, did you use trails or did you stay off them? Most of the time, we walked trails because we were ba we were facing the NBA mm -hmm. when we did run into them, and the NBA was basically operated the same way we did. Uh, they wouldn't set booby traps because chances are they would get their own people just as easy as they would get us. Okay, uh, but what they said ambushes. You could walk into an ambush. Yeah. The point man wore a chicken plate and a three-quarter inch thick steel mm -hmm. vest. I guess that was supposed to work, I don't know. Was it common for people to carry body armor or did they mostly no. just not bother? No. no. We wore t-shirts mostly and you know, long, you know, jungle fatigues. Mm -hmm. When it was real hot, hot weather, you'd even take that off and just wear your, your green t-shirt. Okay. Now would you wear helmets? <sighs> Probably 50% of the time. Um, Whenever we were getting on a chopper for a CA to move to another hilltop, mm -hmm. <laughs> you would put your helmet on because it's stuff blowing around. Okay, so you did at least carry that. You had a helmet with you. It was only you hooked on the back of your rucksack if it wasn't on your head. Okay, uh, so you have a period there, so you're in and out of the Asia and you're there for 30 days or so at a time. Now eventually do the monsoons close in and you have yes. to go out of there? Right, right. It only rained once, it lasts for six months. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> an old line I got. But uh, yeah, it was miserable. It was miserable. I mean, you were wet, constantly soaked. Uh, you lay down, basically you lay down in the mud with your rucksack as your, as your pillow and that was, that's how you survived. Now, First thing in the morning when you woke up, you would light a cigarette burn the leeches off. Now when you're out in the field, would you move by day? And Usually move by day, we would move uh, sometimes two or three clicks, sometimes more. Uh, what we would do is stop, like right before sundown, you would eat and make all your noise and light, you know, fires and all this. And not fires, but the heat tablets. Right. <clears throat> and then you would uh, as soon as it got dark, you might move another 100 feet. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't move far. Because it was basically, you'd be, guys would be falling off the, <laughs> off the edge of the ridge line, and some of them things are pretty steep. So what was the point of shifting 100 feet? Just to make sure that, so if they knew where you were, they would be off by 100 feet if they tried to sneak up on you or mm -hmm. fire uh, rockets or mortars. Okay, uh, and then how would you then set up for the night? We'd set a perimeter, uh, 
you know, a couple guys that he usually three guys to a spot, and he would pass a watch around. Now, most of the time, did the company operate together, or did you split up into platoons? We would uh, mostly platoon level, I would say. Uh, company level, also. Like about 50-50, I would say. Because there wasn't that many. Uh, our platoon was maybe 12 guys, 14 okay. guys. There wasn't many. Okay. Because you always had so many guys. You had guys R&R, &R, you had guys uh, in the rear with jungle rod, or, or this, that, or dysentery, or <laughs> this, that, or the other thing. So, so how many would normally be in the company if you had them together at once? Less than a hundred, I would say. Maybe 75 to 80, yeah. 75 guys. Yeah. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Yeah. A lot less than they're supposed to be. A lot less than it should have been, right. Okay. All right, uh, so this goes on and I guess, but is there, I guess my understanding was that you get around by the beginning of the year and so forth, they largely moved to the coastal areas or out of the hills a little bit mm -hmm. because of the monsoon. And they, would, they would bring us, like Christmas, I remember, they brought us in to the lowlands. Mm -hmm. And it was nice in a way, if the sun came out, you could dry out all your gear, you know, mm -hmm. your socks and <laughs> anything else you wanted to dry out. And, uh, it was a lot easier walking because you, know, you weren't climbing mountains and hills. And, it was just like a rolling hill area. Mm -hmm. And you got your, we got our packages, everybody got their Christmas care packages. In fact, it was actually a, a disgrace because we got so much and, you, and you, you're carrying your world on your back. Mm -hmm. So you know what's important and what's not. And you end up, you know, some, somebody went to, to trouble to send you this and you had to just throw it away. All right, but it's still back out in the field again, and but we're getting kind of going back into the hills again. Back into the mountains again, yeah. It's where we spent all our time running up and down. I remember uh, it's around October when they pulled one of the Marine divisions out up mm -hmm. near the DMZ. And yeah. we, we went up and pulled rear guard action, I guess. But that was a whole battalion went up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't last long. And did anything happen up there? Not to us. I think a couple of the other companies did run into some stuff, but we, again, we had the lucky Delta, you know, it <laughs> really was. Okay. Uh, and now when you were in some of the lowland areas or places like that, would there be any civilians around? No. Okay. No. Now, I can never remember being in a village, um, water buffalo, I hear guys talking about mm -hmm. shooting water buffalo, I don't know, never saw water buffalo. Never saw a rice paddy that I know of. Well, most of those areas, except certain coastal towns, the civilians were pretty much gone. Yeah, at I'm that, sure. At that point. Okay. Uh, so, now were you getting kind of a regular turnover of personnel, people rotating out and in during this time? Actually, not. Our company was pretty much, it seemed like everybody came in pretty much, probably within two months mm -hmm. of each other. Uh, we had the old timers. As, as they went out, it was basically our core group. I mean, you would get new guys every once in a while, but not that often. Uh, that's probably why we only had so many people. Okay. All right. So you got a fair number of people who around there about the same amount of time and you're gaining experience and you kind of know what you're doing. Okay. Uh, now as you kind of move forward in, into the new year, uh, does, does it just continue to be the same? Yes. Yeah. Except it was raining <laughs> January and February. I guess it was around March, end of March, early April is when I got transferred out from Delta to Alpha 2nd of 501st. Okay. All right. And I walked into, you know, I was not happy. Captain Riles said he actually almost threw me on the helicopter because I wouldn't, I kept ignoring him. He kept mm -hmm. saying, you got orders to go to it. And I would just, in one out the other, just make pretend I didn't hear him. And, Stay another day or two until the next helicopter come in, and he tell me, you know, again, finally, I, I had no choice. You know, orders are orders. Mm -hmm. so I got on the chopper and went back to Delta Company, turned all my stuff in that they had given me, issued me, and got on another chopper and flew to Fubai, I believe it mm -hmm. was, which wasn't far, and reported to the Alpha Company, second of five of first orderly run. All right, uh, and now uh, what, what kind of reception do you get there? Uh, they were 
kind of glad to see us, I guess, because they were, like I said, the whole company was probably two to three months. It's, it seemed that way anyway. It probably wasn't, but it seemed like there were an awful lot of new guys. Okay. And we found out later why, because they were always getting wiped out, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. But uh, I guess in the, I don't know, it had to be early May. Uh, we had, uh, we, call, we call it re-up hill, I don't know what it was, but we had, we got hit pretty bad that, on that hill and we lost, I don't know how many guys, and we, they sent us to Eagle Beach. And we had, well, where we I got a lot of new people there. Okay, um, now, but, but but you were in the action where you lost a bunch of guys, the re, re up hill you called it? Yeah, that's what they, yeah. Okay, so what happened then? We got hit in night ambush, or not a night ambush, night infiltration. Okay. And uh, it was pretty bad. Sappers and satchel charges? I guess, because we weren't, we, we weren't sappers, I don't think, because we, were, we weren't behind the wire or anything. We were just set yeah. up at night, night time. But were they using satchel charges or AKs? I, or? It was AKs. Okay, they are shooting at you. So, yeah, yeah, it was okay. definitely AK fire. and It was, it was not good. Uh, but the worst was yet to come. <laughs> All right, so you you so you take some losses, you get hit, they take you off. For Eagle Beach, got Beach. got some new replacements, uh, quite a few new replacements, mm -hmm. and they sent us to Firebase Henderson. It was probably well, it wasn't a battle; it was a massacre. Mm -hmm. uh, first night there, probably eighty percent of the company was brand new. It was us and the Echo Company, of Second and Five Hundred First. They were down. Further down the hill, past the ammo dump, mm -hmm. and we were hit by God knows how many. We lost 32 guys that night, one night. And they set fire to the ammo dump, which was the whole hill was shaking. And I think Echo Company actually got wiped out. Their whole, well, their whole web. The Echo recon. Company is normally recon and they were the recon mortars. guys. They were yeah. recon guys. Okay. Their recon platoon was wiped out. And we lost quite a few guys, though. <coughs> My. Do you have any sense of why that happened? People just didn't know what they were doing? I, I got a feeling somebody knew something was happening. It was the same time as Kent State, and I think they needed something to cover it. I really do. Uh, actually, Henderson, I've read the history, it was, a, it was part of Operation Texas Star. It was, mm -hmm. probably, yeah. it was probably the first major engagement of the whole what became Ripboard. Right. Yeah, and basically, I mean, I guess I've, I've interviewed people who, who saw that from other perspectives, of officers who were there, but yeah, I mean, it was bad. And they very bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, how did you manage to survive all that? Walked off everyone out of scratch. Were you just in the how right place? You, how can you explain it? You know, I had the right place, right time. Yeah. So whatever the enemy was doing, they weren't coming right at your position? No, I was on the other side of the hill. But we knew they, if they wanted to, they could have had that whole entire hill. Mm -hmm. But we went out, me and two or three of the other guys, we crawled up our side to where you could break, and mm -hmm. you know, we saw what was going on. And thank God they stopped. I mean, if they had to turn around and went, we probably could have had everybody on that hill. Right. And was there artillery there? There was artillery. I think they were Orvins. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think it was an Orvin artillery group. And were they the target? Well, they were useless, you know. Okay. <laughs> you know, more of any arm, and you'd see them running around, and they had their brand new M16s and their brand new fatigues and brand new boots, and they didn't want no parts of that war. Mm -hmm. That was their country. They, didn't, they only wanted their bowl of rice to be left alone. Okay. All right. So did they blow up the ammo dump? Yeah, that blew up for, for a day and a half, I guess. And they finally got. I remember this relief company marching up the hill, up the ridge line to relieve us, but we never actually got out of there, I think, till the following day, because of what was that? I don't want, I mean, this is bad memories from bringing up, but <coughs> we had, uh, we didn't have any body bags, mm -hmm. so basically wrapping guys up in ponchos, mm -hmm. or poncho liners, right. and we laid them on the only flat part of the hill, which was basically where the helicopters were, and I'm 50 feet away from where my bunker was, and 
mortar rounds are landing in this thing every once in a while, and a few body parts are flying, and it's mm -hmm. not good. No. All right. Uh, after that, do they take you back to the rear again? Or? Yes, we're back to Eagle Beach again. Mm -hmm. And uh, by then, I was pretty well ready to come home. I was. I would have missed Ripcord anyway, pretty much the Delta part, the yeah. Delta Company part, because I my dearest day was early early July, it was like the sixth, sixth or seventh of July. Okay, now as you got short there, I mean, did you change what you were doing, or did you get a different assignment? You know, I don't think I changed any. I mean, you did what you did. I mean, we. I think they, they finally cut us a break. I, I think originally, I, I thought the original reason they sent us to Firebase Henderson is because usually being on a Firebase is a little bit of a break and we had a, almost an all-new company. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that was a the reason they did it, but yeah, I don't, if it was a reason, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. It did not work. All right. But you weren't then asked, but after that, then you, you weren't involved in a whole lot of activity? No. Okay. All right. I did get wounded uh, Halloween night. Was when I got my bird. Uh, Joe, one of my buddies, Joe Bag, bounced a hand grenade off a tree or something, or slipped out of his hand. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Went off too close. But I ended up seven days on the hospital ship, the sanctuary, USS mm -hmm. Sanctuary, which is actually great. And I finally had a nice sit down, flushing toilet. I guess where I got hit. Oh. I couldn't sit down. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, but you would have had like a bed with clean sheets and yeah, people feeding you. Yeah. Right. Real good food, showers. And yeah, it was nice. All right. Now, did you take an R&R &R while you were in Vietnam? I, t I was real short. I went to Alpha Company. I was in the first sergeant. I, I, his name was Castellitas, a Mexican guy, and he was a really nice guy. He asked me that question, and I hadn't taken it yet, and I only had 80 days left, maybe 90 days. And uh, he, I said, he said, do you want to go? And I told him, I said, I don't have any money. He said, well, if you want to go, I'll give you the money and pay me back. And he did. He gave me a couple hundred dollars. So where did you went go? To, I went to Bangkok. Okay. Where everybody went to Bangkok. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where I lost my virginity. <laughs> All right, so you had the standard Bangkok adventure. Yeah, yeah, drinking too much beer and spending too much money and doing things that you wouldn't want to do in front of your mother. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, what was it like just to be in a place where they weren't shooting at you? It was nice. It was nice. Uh, it was kind of, you know, strange because it's, of course, Bangkok is a huge city. I think it's 10 or 12 maybe, million, maybe even more than that. And uh, But it was hot and sticky there, too. Mm -hmm. The weather was pretty much the same, except like you say, it was like being in a big city anywhere, mm -hmm. I guess. Okay. All right. Um, now, are there other memories from your, your time in Vietnam that kind of stand out for you that you haven't brought in here yet? No, I don't think so. It was just, I think it was pretty standard experience probably for most guys. Some probably had a lot more combat along the way. We seemed to save ours till the very end. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, um, so you get to the End of tour. Uh, so when do you get back to the states? Uh, July. We landed back in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. Sea Tech. I remember getting off the plane and the air was so clean and fresh and dry, and and you could see Mount Rainier off in the distance, and the snow capped, and I'm thinking, man, thank God. When you get back, got back, were there any problems with protesters, or did you get warned? Not about or, no. No, okay. Not a not a not a sea tech. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I my biggest problem was uh, you couldn't talk about it. Okay. You could not talk to anybody. You couldn't t you couldn't tell um, an employer if you were going for a job interview. You you could not tell them you were being on but it's changed around 180 degrees mm -hmm. now. But now people say you know, thank you and they shake your mm -hmm. hand. Right. And, uh, they, anyway, it's, it's changed a lot and I'm glad it has. Okay. So you get back, now you still got time left in your enlistment at that point? Yes, I spent my last six months in Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay, what were you doing there? Same thing, infantry, mo uh, mechanized infantry. We ran around the planes with the APCs. Mm -hmm. And it was nice, it was kind of, uh, 
my opinion of it was it was Uncle Sam's way of decompressing us. Mm -hmm. It was probably 90% of our company was returning Vietnam veterans with six to eight months left in the Army. And that's what I had left, roughly six months. When, I think I reported, we got 30 day leave when he got home. And I think I, re, I reported back in August, I got out in February. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know, were you training people or just. No, just no we were just playing. If we were doing anything, we were playing Army. Mm -hmm. You know, we were out right around the APCs and then we'd come back in. You know, but it seemed to me like all we did was drink a lot of beer and uh, hang around a barracks. Okay. Did the Army make any effort to encourage you to re up? They made on the airplane coming home from Vietnam, they mentioned that they were looking for people who, to become drill sergeants mm -hmm. or drill instructors. And they were offering a you know, three year enlistment or something. Uh, yeah, right. And of course, everybody booed, told the guy to go screw himself. <laughs> <laughs> but once you were at Fort Carson, they weren't doing anything. No, like no, no, they knew better. Now, some of the other guys uh, there, I mean, did did they have either bad attitudes or just not want to do anything? We had a couple of guys who were, you know, they ended up leaving the Army as C1s or E2s. But, uh, like I say, it was, I'm almost convinced it was Uncle Sam knew that they just couldn't turn us back into civilian population at that point. They, a fair number of people, they, they did just send back in the civilian population. In your case, you had enough time left on the, the enlistment, though. Right. That, that right. Too right. Much you for could have extended out. like two months in Vietnam and you would have got it out. Mm -hmm. I think you had, if you had less than six months, I think they put you out. But in a way, I'm glad I stayed because then I ended up, I ended up working for Uncle Sam. So it actually gave me more seniority as far as retirement and all that stuff. Okay. So what did you do after you got out? Well, you mean after I got sober? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I drank myself, to, tried to drink myself to death for twice, 32 years old, I guess. 80, 83, I quit drinking. Okay. And I had to. I just lost my license a couple of times and went through a lot of jobs, a lot of good jobs. Couldn't hold them though. Okay. So what straightened you out? I just quit. I had no choice. It was either die or, you know. Okay. So I stopped drinking. I haven't had one since. Mm -hmm. And I went to work. Uh, I got, I was laid off, of course. I was always being laid off. And I went to um, an employment office and they said, go over to, if you're, if you're a Vietnam era veteran, they had that VRA program. They go over to the Philadelphia Navy Yard or have an opening for apprenticeships. You got to take the uh, written, t written test. Mm -hmm. And if you pass it, you just had to pass it, they had to take it. I, I got a 98 plus my 10 points, so I was sitting pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up working there for 13 years until they closed the yard. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, I went to work for, I transferred, got picked up by the Army Corps of Engineers. I worked for them for six years. And then I worked, uh, got picked up, I took a job with the uh, Coast Guard in Cape May, New Jersey. It's a basic training center for the mm -hmm. entire Coast Guard there. And I worked there for my last 13 years. And I'm with 30, 32 years with Uncle Sam. All right. Uh, and you mentioned, though, that when you were back, you would not, you couldn't tell people that you had been You could um, Even my friends, you couldn't talk. Nobody wanted to hear it. You know, you couldn't talk about it. Uh, couldn't talk to your parents about it, obviously. I mean, my father was World War II, but he caught the ass end of it. He was ended up really in the Army of Occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, mom, she didn't know anything about it. She kept saying, well, my brothers were in the war. Mm -hmm. The war. Yeah. <laughs> At what point did you connect with the Ripcord Association? Uh, you know, I can't even remember now. can't even remember, right? It must have been online. Okay. It must have I must have been farting around on a computer online. I probably ran into it that way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I recognized the names when I got to the Delta Company guys. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I know all these guys because I was, yeah. and uh, you know, they were lucky enough or unlucky enough to actually have to go through the Ripcord experience mm -hmm. where I didn't have a lot of fun, but I would have missed most of Ripcord anyway. Like I said, I was. Yeah, I mean, the stuff that Delta that was, got into, really, it was in July. That, that was the end of July, yeah. yeah. So. All right. Right place at the right time. Okay. And, and I guess to look back on it, um, 
what effect do you think your time in the army had on you, good or bad? I think good. Um, I'm very proud of what we did. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed at all. I never did anything to be ashamed of. Proud. We, we, Uncle Sam called us. We did it. Mm -hmm. uh, would I have ever joined on my own militia? No. I was drafted. I didn't run away from it. You know, it was expected in our family. If you were called, you went. All right. Do you think you took anything out of the experience that helped you later on? I mean, I guess you had to work through some stuff after you got back. Oh, yeah. You were drinking yeah, well, a lot of time yeah. and so forth. Oh, yeah. That was, that was not a good time. That was a black time in my life mm -hmm. for 15 years, 16 years, whatever it was. <laughs> but uh, it all worked out. Okay. Well, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to share the story today. Then. No problem. All thank right. you very much. I feel better already.